Welcome to the Lynch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, we're covering live streaming with Ali Acock patterson and Joshua Richardson, two of Lynch Rentals' most knowledgeable former techs who now head up the product development team. With everyone safely stuck in their homes right now, we've seen a renewed interest in live streaming. From teachers to musicians, more and more people are having to learn how to navigate this technology, and it can be a real struggle if you're approaching it for the first time. We'll talk through the basics all the way up through professional solutions to hopefully make this all just a little bit easier. Uh, Ali, Josh, thank you for joining me. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I want to talk about live streaming today. We've had, I think, a large new interest in live streaming since everybody is quarantine now. I think we have a lot of customers kind of getting into this for the first time. So I, I want to try to kind of talk through, you know, what live streaming is and what you need to get started. But first, I want to talk about the customers we have live streaming now. Who are you all finding are typically the people starting to get into live streaming? So specifically, obviously, a lot of uh, schools and uh, businesses are starting to use live streaming for the way they interact with each other. And instead of having your standard meetings or standard classroom settings, people are having to go online so they can do everything remotely. Uh, specifically, my sister-in-law is a theater director. She's actually had some graduates on Broadway. So all of her students who are doing auditions for the next level of their career are starting to talk about live streaming. And so I've spent a lot of time talking to middle schooler and high school parents about how to best capture their students' auditions for Juilliard and things like that. Yeah. And I think also we've seen a pretty big uptick in uh, the amount of people wanting to creatively live stream, whether that's music or uh, whatever they were doing before they were locked in their house for you know, three months. And the only way to have that same creativity is to just blast it out onto the internet. Yeah, I definitely think the lockdown uh, from when this all started to now, I think people have definitely gotten a lot more creative in how they're presenting their video feeds. It's the only thing we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am curious about that. How do you think, and I guess we'll get into more specifics about how to do this gear wise later, but since we're on the topic now, how do you think people are trying to, you know, if they're building an audience rather than just like interacting with one person? Uh, what are the ways you're seeing people try to kind of stream in a creative or different way? Definitely people are getting more creative with their room setups. Uh, because, I mean, when you're live streaming, or when most people begin live streaming, I guess, there's not. it's going to be a static camera. So what you're looking at in that frame is going to be what you're looking at for the entirety of the live stream. So making the space more creative, visually interesting, I guess, uh, goes a long way. Okay. Yeah. I was expecting the answer to be something like graphics or like picture in picture or something. You're saying That's just too a, hard. as simple as, <laughs> yeah. as simple as just like make your room look nice. Yeah. 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 Before we start talking about what you need to do to get started and what sorts of uh, cameras and lights you might need, I think the first thing people are going to have to decide on is a service, what platform they're going to use. I think a lot for a lot of our customers, that default is YouTube Live. Is that what you're seeing most people use? Um, I've seen plenty of streams just go out over Facebook because I feel like that's the most accessible uh, platform mm -hmm. for most people. Generally, most people have a Facebook account. Even if they don't use it regularly, they have one they can log into. There is some sort of audience already there that gets a notification. I think that's definitely the, the easiest one to jump to. Oh, I see. So you're saying if you're to take our musician example, if you already have a fan group or whatever, mm -hmm. it's easy to sort of leverage that versus maybe not everybody already has like a YouTube channel with a bunch of subscribers. Yeah. Um, getting a YouTube stream link out to all the people who want to see it, uh, especially if you're if you have a larger online presence and maybe you don't use YouTube all that much, it could be a lot harder to to get that notification to pop up on people's phones or computers. Whereas Facebook, unfortunately, <laughs> most people rely on that already too much for for interpersonal connection. So yeah. ping, there you go. You got a you got a notification to go watch your favorite band play. Do you feel like there are any inherent pros or cons between these platforms or is it more just about following your audience where your audience already is? In the beginning, I feel like YouTube was kind of on the forefront of 
the more experimental type of uh, streaming, like they would allow 3D streams or 360 streams. Uh, they were the first to allow 4K streams, I believe. I'm not sure if that's still the case. I haven't checked in with Facebook streaming in a minute, but I think they've updated, and most of them are have some kind of feature parity at this point. It's probably going to be more just where you want to find your viewers. And I, I guess we're we're kind of skipping a large one, which is Twitch, which, mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm an old man and I'm not familiar with Twitch. In a similar way as you're describing Facebook Live, the primary advantage to Twitch seems to be that you can sort of build an audience on Twitch and keep your audience there. Do we see many people, like professional customers, using Switch that haven't already sort of built a Switch platform? Or Twitch. I keep saying Switch. <laughs> Twitch. Uh, you are Twitch an old with a man. T. Yeah, I'm just mixing up all the internet things that I don't understand. <laughs> don't make yourself a rhubarb pie while you're at it. <laughs> I actually used Twitch last week for the first time vetting a new product that we have. And I tried to set up a YouTube live account and it told me I had to wait 24 hours for it to be authorized, which was a real pain. And so uh, I reached out to someone in our fulfillment department who is pretty tech savvy. He's uh, big into gaming. And so I know he was using Twitch for that kind of stuff. He also has used it for um, some charity work he's done with St. Jude. And he set me up a test account just so that we could test the streaming capabilities of this product. But I think largely the ease of use for the platform does tie directly into the devices that you want to use because some are optimized for one platform and not another. Some as a platform updates, you know, API settings or something like that, it's going to knock compatibility out, which is kind of a drag. And you have to wait for whatever device it is that you're relying on for your streaming to then update to be able to be compatible again. And so while I do agree that Facebook Live is probably the most accessible, I do think there are some variations to how you're going to use that platform based on the device you're going to use. Going back to Twitch uh, specifically, what they do, they do just incredibly well. Since it is kind of tailored toward video game streaming, the overlays you can throw on there, the interactions you can have with people watching, uh, the stuff that's integrated specifically for video games is just unbeatable for a streaming platform. They've also been doing it probably the longest. Twitch started as a thing called Justin TV, where it was a dude just streaming his life 24-7. Uh, <laughs> awesome. I didn't kind know of, that. Yeah, That's yeah, incredible. Yeah. Um, and then that kind of, I believe that platform eventually started letting people stream themselves and then eventually turned into twitch.tv. But yeah, they've just been doing it the longest. So they have, they have tools that make it easier. Uh, the integrations that they have built into the platform are really nice. It really integrates well with certain uh, softwares. Um, so that makes it a lot easier. And there is a built-in audience for specific things on Twitch. I would say if you're doing video game streaming or music streaming, both of those are pretty easy to jump into at this point. Uh, I think one of the more attractive things about Twitch, specifically in live streaming in general for people, is that the the barrier for entry is super, super low. Like You, you really don't need much gear to get started with this. And I, I want to run by you. Say I'm just getting started in this. Uh, I want to stream, say, video games from my house. What all would I hypothetically need at just a basic level if I don't want to spend any money whatsoever? You can usually do it with a laptop with a built-in camera with zero additional hardware, you know, if that's where you want to start. I would say absolute essential for me is going to be a decent webcam uh, with probably a decent mic on it. And then once you have that, I think you're good to go. Most like even if you go and look at the top streams on Twitch, um, they may have a lot of fancy graphics going around their their cameras and just kind of pretty it up a little bit. But really, it's still a pretty standard webcam look. And the resolutions people are streaming on Twitch, it's not going to make that much difference. Just, you know, if you streamed a red onto your Twitch channel, uh, <laughs> that would be it's lost. It's still a stream. Yeah. yeah. It'd be lost on 99% of the people watching. Yeah. So this is coming through at like, what, 720, probably no matter what camera you're using. Uh, no, you, you can definitely stream higher, but I think 
if you can stream a 1080p webcam, nobody's going to complain about that. Right. And I mean, that's assuming people are even using monitors. You right. know, there's still a lot of people using screens that are not going to process over 720. And if that's what they're used to. Then they're not going to worry too much about a quality degradation issue. And I, I guess we don't have to limit this to video games and Twitch. This is essentially the setup you could get started with no matter what you're doing is just yeah. a relatively good webcam, which can be had for surely under $150. Oh, yeah. Um, I like Logitech's options around $100. It's just hard to go wrong with those. They have decent mics. They have pretty good image quality just right out of the box. And they just use standard USB 2, um, so you don't need anything fancy to run it. I would definitely, if I was live streaming from home, want to get an audio interface, though, because I am kind of a snob when it comes to audio. And so I definitely think some kind of controllable USB interface is probably worth the investment, especially because most of them aren't that expensive. For the uninitiated, what exactly is a USB interface? USB interface is probably not the right thing. I was thinking of like a Scarlet, which I think is what you're using, right, Ryan? Yeah, that's what I have in my home office here. So it's just a, let me look at the model number. It's right here on my desk. Scarlet Solo, uh, the company who made it is Focusrite. I think this is probably a really common thing for musicians. I'm sure, Josh, you're familiar with this thing, too. Yeah, Focusrite's good. Uh, they're known for their preamp quality. So if you're running a condenser mic or a mic that takes a lot of gain, uh, you'll get a better sound out of anything Focusrite, turns out. It was like 200 bucks. I got it at a guitar center. And yeah, you can run an instrument into it too. So I've just got a mic running into it now. But no, hook that um, guitar up and see what you get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a guitar Tread. sitting here behind me. <laughs> we're going to we're gonna get real in the podcast. I'm going to rock you guys out. <laughs> but even G, C, and A chord. I'm going to rock you guys out. I've yeah. been learning. G, C, and A. Yeah. Three whole chords. I hope chords. you guys like folk music. I do. Um, but even if, I mean, even if you're not going to use a Scarlet, because what Joshua said, he did kind of remind me of the fact that I'm a total snob. And so there are a lot of microphones that aren't going to require you to have a true interface. You can also just use a USB microphone. We just got the Rode NT-USB Mini in. I mean, I think it's like 100 bucks. And what you get in terms of being able to monitor and improve the audio quality over what's built into your computer, I think for 100 bucks, it's absolutely worth it. Another sort of early setup thing people will need is some sort of software, especially if you're juggling multiple inputs and pretty much essential if you're working with multiple cameras. I know we on our website often recommend uh, OBS. Mm -hmm. uh, have you all worked with that much? Yes, the open broadcasting software. Yeah, OBS stands for open broadcasting software. And by open, it means open source and free. So that's another low cost tool to get into all this. Yeah, it has the look of free software, but it, it actually <laughs> it's very powerful for it has the look of free software, the look of broadcast software. <laughs> Both. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So OBS um, has been working on it for years and years. Uh, it, it's very good. It's very powerful, but it doesn't have a lot of polish. Uh, one easy way to make that better is to go ahead and get Streamlabs version of OBS. Streamlabs is a company who kind of piggybacks off of Twitch. Um, they started with uh, early integrations where you could like uh, see your uh, the people in your stream chatting. You can make it easy for them to subscribe and give you money, um, that kind of thing. But they've built their own version of OBS. And that's a pretty good place to start for most people just because it has a little more polish on it. It's a little easier to use. Oh, I wasn't familiar with that. Is that free as well? It is. It is. You could also go with XSplit, which is uh, basically it does exactly what OBS does, but it's a paid software, so it's going to have a little more polish and it's going to have a little better support uh, if you run into issues. But OBS just is it's such an easy resource because so many people use it and there are so many people on the internet talking about it. So most problems you have, you can do a quick Google search uh, and fix it just because of the ubiquity of it. Yeah, and it, it integrates directly with every platform we've covered here for sure and pretty much everything that you're going to run into on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so it uses RTMP, um, which is what most streaming platforms use. So there's a unique key that your streaming platform puts out. You plug that into OBS and boom, you're sending a signal to whatever platform you choose. 
And I, gu- I guess we should be clear here about what the software is doing. For beginners, at a basic level, this is sort of like a switcher. It's going to allow you to combine multiple video inputs, whether that's multiple cameras or a camera and a capture deck. It'll also give you the ability to sort of better monitor audio levels, bring in graphics, bring in pre-recorded assets, things like that. Is that about right? Yeah, all of that. Uh, You can screen capture specific windows. You can do a full computer screen capture of your whole desktop. The uh, like media integration, as far as like bringing in graphics and such, isn't the greatest. Yeah, you're probably going to want to switcher for most of that stuff. Yeah, if you're doing a lot of back and forth switching, uh, hardware switcher might be the way to go. But go back to video gaming. If you're capturing a game screen, putting your webcam over the top of it, and you just need something to you know, throw a we'll be back soon uh, screen over the top of it in between, you know, your streaming, just something easy like that. Just a couple different things loaded up. You want to switch between. It's super helpful for that. Okay, so this is probably the next step for our hypothetical beginner. Once you've sort of been working on your laptop with no outside resources for a little bit, maybe pick up a mic next and increase your audio quality and then maybe integrate software like OBS to work with graphics and maybe multiple video sources. Yeah, uh, lighting I would throw in there too is something probably you want to work on early, even if it's just a couple cheap IKEA lamps or something. Oh, don't recommend those to people. Oh, I mean, (laughs) you can't beat a $20 IKEA lamp (laughs) if you need some extra lighting. You just can't beat it. That's true. Yeah, we should we should cover lighting. That's not something I planned on talking about because it didn't even occur to me. But it's just as important to light and make your space look good on this sort of platform as it is, you know, a traditional just video. Do we have particular lights that we see customers using for this kind of thing? The uh, the flapjack, the ring light, um, I know is something that started to become pretty popular since all of this started just because it's exactly like it sounds like it's just a circle with a cutout in the middle that you can mount a camera to and then you can mount it depending on uh, additional hardware that you have you can mount it to a tripod so if you're doing just like a medium close-up shot of yourself you know talking head style shoot it's just a super simple plug and play solution that in a small space gives you pretty adequate lighting for your face at least yeah and uh i would say a step up from that would probably be something like uh, a couple of the Manfrotto Lycos lights. Those are relatively small, relatively inexpensive. Just one in front for key, softened, and then something to light the rim of your hair. And I mean, that looks so good on a stream just immediately. And uh, for me, it's about getting that light as big as possible. So you're probably going to want some kind of diffuser that kind of right. spreads it out and you know softens it. You can always tell when someone has like a single bulb light just pointed at their head, just yes. really harsh shadow. <laughs> overly contrasty is just big soft light is what you want to light your face for a stream in my opinion uh so most people you know if they're bringing in a camera that isn't like a direct webcam or even a video game console or some sort of video deck are gonna need a way to connect a video source to their computer i know we have a couple of devices like that and i want to talk through the differences between them and i want to start with the black magic web presenter. I know this is probably the simplest to use option we have for that. Is that about right? Yeah, for sure. Um, So anything that takes a video camera and just outputs it as a webcam signal is going to be the easiest way to to integrate that into a setup. I also like the fact that on ours, we include the smart panel. So you do have some kind of option to interface with the web presenter. I don't think the web presenter without some kind of panel is nearly as an attractive product as the way we offer it, but definitely just a super simple plug and play kind of device. And it essentially just plugs into your computer over USB and will take any HDMI or SDI input and your computer just treats that as a webcam. Right. That process right there of the down converting it into that webcam package for your computer to understand it without having to configure anything, I think is why it's been so popular. Yep. That's the magic. <laughs> what are the, uh, what are the products we carry that you prefer to the web presenter and why? So a direct alternative is going to be the, uh, Elgato HD 60 S that we just got in. You know, it's a gaming device and I am not, my background is definitely not in gaming. And so I was kind of intimidated 
buy it, even though it's just this little tiny box. But once you get the software downloaded and the software is free, it's called Game Capture. You can get it for Mac or Windows. You do have to make sure that your computer, the system requirements are met because it will, it's, it can be kind of a finicky little thing and it'll tell you when it doesn't like what you're doing. But if you've got a compatible you know, computer and you're using all the compatible cables, it literally is a plug and play device. You just plug whatever HDMI source you have into the Elgato, run the game capture software. And from within the software, you can record directly to your hard drive on your computer. You can set the streaming rate anywhere from like 480 or three megabits per second, all the way up to 1080 P or I at 60 frames per second. So you can stream and capture from that. It's very intuitive. Something I also like is if you capture it, you can go into your editing tab and convert your footage to ProRes if you want. You can share it straight to an iPhone, straight to Apple TV. Coming from, oh, I like the Black Magic because there's no software, I made a f- full, <laughs> had a full change of heart into the Elgato system because what they have available as their built in tools is just so simple and easy for people to use that if they're not crazy popular, then we've done a poor job representing them. Is it something you would recommend only for like a a gaming oriented stream or would it work just as well for just like a traditional camera? Absolutely not. Once I started messing around with it, I started thinking about how it could solve some problems with some less traditional cameras, specifically the uh, Bird Dog P200 camera, because there's not a memory card option for that. So we built a little kit that allows you to capture and stream and control a PTZ camera. The control is over RS-232 instead of NDI. So people who are beginners, trust me, that's easier. All these letters and nonsense. Um, Mm -hmm. But basically, you just plug the camera's HDMI port into the device, and you've got your signal straight up. You can start streaming directly from the software. You can monitor from the software. Uh, Like I said, you can convert to ProRes from the software, and that just gives you an opportunity to have a seamless input into a streaming device from a camera that isn't really built for capturing. And there are a lot of manufacturers who are turning their own cameras through their own software into webcams that can kind of do this and bypass a capture device. Uh, Fuji has a Windows webcam uh, suite that you can download. They are developing Mac. I don't know if it's out of beta yet, but Canon has one. Uh, Sony has actually had not the webcam service, but they've had their CI service for a while now. It predates all of this staying at home stuff. But I feel like the software they use, the manufacturers use, is a little clunky. And so even though a camera can't, a lot of these cameras, especially if you're using smaller photo cameras, can be converted to your webcam pretty easily with what you probably already have if you own this camera, I still think a capture device is going to give you better, you know, all around benefits because of the way it integrates into platforms and the way it allows you different controls over settings that are more intuitive than trying to go from a brand manufacturer's platform. Yeah, especially since they're not all that expensive. Yep, and ones that turn your computer just into a webcam. Nothing, there's nothing easier than that. It's right, just the absolutely. Thing to do. All right, well, we'll take a quick break here, and uh, when we come back, we'll talk about some, some higher-end gear we have for maybe more professional multicam shoots. If you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back. We're talking live streaming and specifically in the second half here, I kind of want to get into a little bit more higher end, maybe professional options. So what do you think are our best kind of higher end uh, live streaming solutions? Um, I think starting out, especially if you're going to start bringing in a switcher, you do kind of get into NDI being more worth what you pay for it because you do have a lot of systems that give you control and built-in streaming and just like a central place. We can control the cameras. You can change their settings. 
uh, depending on the camera you're using and the NDI license you have, you can control camera movements, essentially having a robotic camera. But then if you wanted to do just kind of like a simpler, just a very basic couple cameras stream, you don't want to go full on into IP-based video productions. I think the A10 Mini Pro is a really good, affordable option for most people. It's HDMI only, so I have a hard time recommending people do multiple camera setups over HDMI just because there's no locking connector. But um, it actually can work as a CCU with the pocket cameras, and it allows you to stream. It has a built-in engine so that you're not double compressing the image when you output it over a stream. And it's just a super easy switcher to use. If you've never used any kind of switching device before, I think most people could probably get it figured out in an hour tops. And that includes, you know, graphic integration. Yeah. And um, I think we ran into some issues for a while with the Sling Studio, but it's still a pretty good option. It does everything all in one wireless router looking box uh, and does it wirelessly to cameras. So don't sleep on that one. Yeah. I mean, it over delivers for the qual like build quality and stuff. It's not always the most reliable system, but I mean, the software for it, the control console is really nice. Mm -hmm. And you really, I mean, the graphics are already built into the program. You can put in like score, you know, they've already got the scoreboard boxes made for you. And uh, I think we see a lot of churches using those just because they can stream from such a large space. Up to four active inputs at a time. So you could have four wireless cameras. You can also use a smart device. Yep. Also definitely worth noting. Uh, you can just download an app on your phone and it immediately becomes a camera. Yeah. We had a lot of schools using those too. I know high schools and stuff for sports. I think it's a really good option for that. It's, it's a really great thing for like streaming multiple video sources from the field without too, too much setup. I think if anything, the problem we had with it was maybe Sling Studios marketing was too good. <laughs> and people sort of thought it could do everything and be just 100% reliable in every case. And it's it's not that. It's not like a miracle device. Yeah. Uh, but it is it is really good at what it does so long as you're okay with working around a few caveats. Yeah, and wireless video is never a sure thing. So right. always have a backup if you're streaming video wirelessly every time. Right, yeah. We should go into more detail about that because we have to cover a lot in calls with customers. So what Ali mentioned earlier about SDI always being preferable to HDMI for locking connections is 1 million percent true. But another reason why we would always recommend SDI over HDMI is that it's much more reliable over long runs. The kind of like past 50 foot runs you're going to have to do if you're doing multiple cameras out in the field. Uh, I you can run our SDI cables super reliably for like 150 feet, whereas we don't recommend HDMI for anything over 50 feet. And even at 50 feet, the cable is so long at that point that it's difficult to work with. I also think that's one of the appeals of using NDI since it is, uh, you know, you're using a CAT6 cable usually. So you also have locking connectors on that. They're not quite as solid as what you're going to get with an SDI cable, but they're also capable of, you know, when using NDI technology, transmitting a lot more information back and forth. Uh, speaking of NDI, I want to get back to that kit you mentioned earlier, Ali, because uh, I think that's probably built toward the kind of higher end professional customers we're talking about now. We also, though, have a kit or rather two kits. Those are the remote presentation live streaming kits. If you want to search for them on our website, we'll also link to them in the show notes, obviously. But uh, I want to talk about what's included with those and why and what the difference is between the two kits. So we'll we'll start with the two kits. We have a basic and advanced. And Josh, what is the difference between those two? Yeah, so the basic kit is just like it says. It's pretty basic. It's going to be a, a camera, a small tripod, Gorillapod specifically from Joby, Joby, however you say that. Um, it's designed more for sitting on top of your your desk just a something that's compact small it's got a small shotgun microphone that attached to the top of the camera it's kind of all one piece that just runs into a black magic web presenter um, super simple you're probably not going to be moving it around much you're going to set up your shot and hit stream but in the advanced kit uh, we add better audio options we include both a lav kit which has a small omnidirectional mic that would clip onto your lapel and also a shotgun mic for directed audio pickup 
we include both because depending on your room setup, one may be beneficial over the other. And honestly, it never hurts to run both at the same time for backup audio. Uh, we also include a full-size tripod with the advanced kit, and that has a couple benefits. You can get different height adjustments. It's easier to control your pan and tilt with that. And I mean, if you have a friend who who wants to move a camera around, it is a fluid head, so you could get a little movement in your shot as well. And that is going to the uh, the same Blackmagic web presenter. Slight upgrade to the camera as well. I'm just going to have a, a pretty similar image on both, especially going through that web presenter. Yeah, I think the basic kit is definitely the kind of thing that fits into that scenario of you're sending something to your client. Uh, I do think the tripod alone makes it feel a little bit more uh, approachable versus the other one. Like the advanced kit definitely feels like we're using prosumer to professional quality gear. And so if you're a complete novice and you've been told by a production house, you have to do this thing for an interview for a commercial coming up, we're going to send everything to you. I do think the basic kit is going to be the option that feels the easiest to come into uh, that Joby tripod can mount on a tabletop or, you know, a banister. The legs are really flexible so they can kind of bend around any object. And so I do think from that standpoint, the basic kit's a little less intimidating and consequently has also been a little more popular. Okay. So market wise, you're saying that the basic kit would be more for somebody who doesn't have any video experience and wants to stream themselves or someone who's sending out a kit to someone with no video experience. The advanced kit is more for somebody who knows a little bit of video basics and wants just kind of a step up in quality. Correct. And we do include also uh, one thing that's not to be overlooked. We do include guides for both of these kits that gives you like pictures identifying the names of the different parts and then a how-to guide that goes step by step to make sure that when the gear arrives to whoever will be using it, they really have a resource. They don't have to dig through, you know, a dozen different product manuals. They just have a very quick, this is how you get this running, which is always a nice thing to be able to provide for someone. So to wrap up here, I want to close with what do you think are some of the most common mistakes people make who are getting into this for the first time? Radio frequencies are real. They will interfere with your shoot. <laughs> Don't take them lightly. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? What, what, are the, what are the radio frequencies people have trouble with? I mean, we have a lot of people who uh, rent things like the Teradek Video Go, uh, the 4G version. And because of the way the subscriptions are built, we can't offer it in a bonded option and you know people are out in the field or you know they're out in remote areas that they couldn't really do like a speed test on the device uh, prior to renting it and I feel like a lot of times people's expectations are a little high of what they should be able to seamlessly be able to stream from some areas and so uh, with the Terra Deck Video Go if you're getting the 4G version from us we do have a Google Fi SIM card that's included um, and so I would definitely recommend looking at your coverage map prior to renting it and pinpointing where you're going to be and trying to determine in advance if you need to go ahead and invest in that bonded streaming. Uh, bonded streaming, of course, is you're going to be using the wireless signal available around you bonded with cellular streaming so that you have, uh, doesn't necessarily improve the signal over one or the other. It just gives you some redundancy. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, I would add to that, even if you're not in the field, not streaming over 4G, test and consider the quality of your internet connection, even if it's a direct internet connection. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who are streaming some sort of business conference from like a hotel convention <laughs> center and are using the hotel's internet and, speed internet <laughs> right exactly even if it's a, a direct ethernet connection it's rarely going to be fast enough to stream anything uh, we've had people trying to stream from like the floor at ces no matter the connection method yeah you're never going to have a clean signal you've got thousands and thousands of frequencies bouncing around yes yeah, so yeah if possible Test your connection beforehand and make sure you're going to have enough uh, internet speed to do this stuff. Josh, you got any red flags? Yeah, mine's pretty simple. Um, <laughs> just uh -huh. give yourself enough time <laughs> to, yes. to, to figure out what you want to do, how you need to set it up to test, like you guys said. 
if you're renting stuff from us, I would say an extra day at least. But all of this stuff, you're going to be learning a half a dozen new products all at once. So when you rent this, you really have to give yourself some time to look over everything, figure out how it's working together, how and how that can work to achieve the goal that you're trying to get from your live stream. All right. Well, if you're if you're ordering stuff for live streaming, keep all this in mind. Uh, give us a call if you have any questions. As always, Allie and Josh, thank you for coming in. Thanks for having us. Uh, we will link to everything we've discussed here in the show notes, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Linternals podcast. Just another reminder that everything we covered here will be linked to in the show notes for this week's episode. And if you have any questions, whether it's war or rental or not, and especially if you're a teacher, we're happy to help you if you email us at support at lensrentals.com. The Lens Rentals podcast is a production of lensrentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at lensrentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sokala will leave you with an inspirational quote. When a new technology rolls out, you're either part of the steamroller or part of the road. Stuart Brand.